Greetings and salutations. Ollie here, and today I wanted to address one of my viewers. In the last few months, I've met some awesome people through my YouTube channel, and as a result, I've had some really good exchanges with people, and some of these exchanges have been so deep and so dense that I wanted to respond in video format. So this video is for someone by the name of Goodhearted, who has commented on a number of my videos, and every time this person comments, they have extremely deep insights and they often bring up very, very challenging questions. So good hearted, thanks for waiting, sorry for the delay. Finally, here's my response to some of the comments you made a couple of weeks ago in one of my videos. So good hearted had some very, very good questions. One of the first questions that she asked was, why is it so difficult to abandon old mental habits? Especially those that keep us stuck or make us feel as if we're stuck. More specifically, she wanted to know if there's a trick or a shortcut to get rid of these unhelpful ideas and beliefs and patterns of thinking a little bit quicker. Unfortunately, good hearted, as I said in my first response to you, I don't think there are any shortcuts. No matter what path you take in an attempt to clear the clutter, you're gonna have to put in some work and it's gonna take time. Because those habits, those mental patterns of thinking that you're trying to get rid of, they were conditioned over many, many years. So you can't really expect to get rid of something quickly if it took decades to create. There are certainly things we can do and I would assume that some of these things are more effective than others. I think this also depends on your personal aptitudes, your tendencies, and so on. But nevertheless, I'll share a couple of these practices with you now. And these are, of course, practices that I have used to some extent, uh, some more than others. But through my research and through my experiments, I have found that these are the sort of popular recurring ones. I think the number one key is awareness. Being aware of those thought patterns, those attitudes, those beliefs, because oftentimes they are hidden away or they're obscured by other things. So the number one key in my opinion is to become aware of what's happening inside you, inside your mind and inside your heart. That's step one and that involves mindfulness. Now if Regularly checking in on your state of mind is difficult for you. You can set reminders on your phone, on your watch, or whatever. And if it's too difficult for you to just observe what's happening in there, it might be helpful to write in a thought journal. Everyone that I know who has ever tried this has had nothing but positive things to say. It's really helpful to get your thoughts on the page. This is one of the ways that we can actually observe them more effectively. So that might be a useful practice for you. But any way you dice it, whether you write in a journal or not, mindfulness is, in my opinion, the first step. Now mindfulness is merely the act of being present. It's the act of being here and now, not distracted by different things, but fully alert and aware of what's happening inside and out. Unlike meditation, you're not necessarily trying to bring the mind to silence. And in fact, the purpose of mindfulness is not to silence the mind, but to listen to the mind and to observe the mind. You don't have to sit in a lotus position. You don't have to count your breaths. You merely have to pay attention to what's happening inside. And to do so regularly, consistently, until it becomes a habit in itself. And then you won't have to write in a journal or do anything. It'll just be something that you do all the time. But again, to build this habit will take time. So there are no shortcuts. You just have to start doing it. Now this brings us to the next points that you made and they were all extremely pertinent to this conversation. You said the way that we're raised, our environment and our influences, this has a huge impact on our ability to be mindful. Trying to decide what's the right or wrong mind chatter to listen to is difficult because of your conditioning and your cultural programming. 
Now, I agree with you on that point. It is very difficult to determine whether the thoughts that you're having are your thoughts or they are someone else's thoughts. Whether they've been inserted there by some kind of institution or group or individual. So I will suggest the following advice. Don't worry about what's right and what's wrong chatter. The point of mindfulness is not to judge and evaluate your thoughts and emotions. And in fact, I did a Daily Bread video a short while ago where I quoted Jiddu Krishnamurti and he says the following. Meditation is to be aware of every thought and every feeling. Never to say it is right or wrong, but just to watch it and move with it. Now that's the part I shared in the Daily Bread video, but there's more to it. And I held the rest of it back and I will share it with you now. He says, in that watching, you begin to understand the whole movement of thought and feeling. And out of this awareness comes silence. Silence put together by thought is stagnant. But silence that comes when thought has understood its own beginning, the nature of itself, understood how all thought is never free but always old, this silence is meditation, in which the meditator is entirely absent, for the mind has emptied itself of the past. Now I know that I just said that mindfulness and meditation are not the same thing, but I, I guess I lied. <laughs> it really depends on how you define these terms, and ultimately it doesn't really matter whether you call it mindfulness or meditation. It's all one process, and it's all one activity. It's the process of knowing yourself and exploring the psyche. And so it begins with this non-judgmental observation which Krishnamurti describes at the beginning. And eventually that will lead to a deeper state of meditation, which is this state of inner silence, where one simply experiences things without the filter of thinking and symbols and value statements. When you achieve that state, you just are, and you're at peace with yourself and the state of things around you. Mindfulness is just the first step to meditation, and for people who don't have an established practice, and for people who have more difficulty going within, I think that it's sort of the gateway to meditation. The whole process, as described by Krishnamurti here, is not only beautiful, but reflective of my own personal experience, and I'm sure the experiences of many others. It is possible to achieve a meditative state where you no longer exist. Of course, this is a temporary thing, because as the mind begins to churn out thoughts again, you find yourself, you become aware of yourself again. But in that deep meditative state, there is no you, and there is no me, there simply is. You simply are, and you, are not necessarily what you think you are at that point. It's not the personality, it's not the name, it's not the roles, it's something else. It's pure awareness, pure consciousness, the self with a capital S, it doesn't really matter what you call it. I know these are lofty things that we're talking about, but when you kind of have an idea of what the experience might be like, it will help you along the way. So I wanna tell you about this stuff. I don't wanna just talk about the immediate and the practical, I want to talk about the experiences that may come as you develop, establish, and maintain a practice. So as you get more comfortable observing your thoughts non-judgmentally, and as you gain a greater understanding of this relationship between your personality, your ideas, and your emotions, it will become much easier to discern between the right kind of mental chatter and the wrong kind. Now, of course, I would argue there's no such thing as right or wrong mental chatter. I prefer to use terms like helpful and unhelpful, valid and invalid, but I think ultimately we're saying the same thing. It's not wrong to have negative thoughts. And oftentimes you're not the one producing those thoughts. They are conditioned responses as you've already alluded to in your comments. So to call it wrong leads to this feeling of shame, of having failed or of not being good enough. And so to me, that's not a very helpful way of looking at it. Because ultimately, none of these things come from you. All of these things come from the mind. And 
whether the mind has been influenced by the public education system or your previous religion or whatever makes no difference. It's the mind that is being influenced. It's the mind that is being conditioned. And you, good-hearted, you're not your mind. And through mindfulness and meditation, you may come to realize this, not in an intellectual way, which is, as Krishnamurti says, stagnant, but in a first-hand experiential way. You will feel yourself as you truly are. And then, well, and then I look forward to hearing what you have to say about that experience because it's something else. And there's one more comment that you made that I would like to address. You said, it seems undermining to challenge our mind at times, especially if others implore that there needs to be a change in our thought process. And we're trying to figure out the proper choices for ourselves. It's a trust factor. Am I being moved or influenced in the right direction? Am I in control or are they controlling me? Very, very good points, as usual. How do you know that these people are moving you in the right direction? How can you trust that what they're saying supersedes what you feel and what you believe? I think that first and foremost, you have to get to a place where you can trust yourself, where you can be confident in what's happening inside you, where you can be confident that the thoughts you're having are valid, and then you actually have to start trusting yourself. It's one thing to say that you've reached a place where you can trust yourself. It's another thing altogether to actually trust yourself. So once you get there, once you've been mindful, and once you've been observing, and once you've begun to understand, you can start to trust yourself. You can start to trust the thoughts and the emotions that you experience. When you get to that place where you can trust yourself, you can start to observe external influences objectively. The people who are trying to counsel, influence, and nudge you in certain directions, they might have your best interests in mind. And I would say they probably do. They might also have the best intentions. The advice that they're giving you, the counseling, they're not saying this stuff to undermine you. In their minds and in their hearts, they have good intentions. They think you need to change something and they're trying to help you do that. But ultimately, regardless of whose interests they have in mind and what their intentions are, you know what's right for you. You know. And how do you get to a place where you can trust yourself? Well, let me ask you this. Should you trust a stranger? Someone you've never met and know nothing about? Probably not. Well, then I would argue that in order to trust yourself, you have to know who it is that you are trusting. Yes. Commandment number one, know yourself. If you want to get to a place where you can trust yourself, you have to get to know yourself completely. Warts and all. The more you know yourself accurately, the more you can trust yourself and accept yourself and love yourself. Knowing yourself is a prerequisite to all of those things. It doesn't matter how much you want to trust yourself. It doesn't matter how much you want to love and accept yourself. You can't love what you don't know and what you don't understand. You can't accept what you don't know and what you don't understand. So I'm going to end the video like this. Know thyself. And that's what mindfulness and meditation and all the stuff that I talk about in my videos is about. It's about knowing yourself not only as an individual but as a specimen of the human race. To know how your mind works and how your emotions work. To understand your biology and your cognitive capabilities. If people are able to cause you to doubt yourself to the point where you feel stuck and genuinely don't know how to proceed, I would suggest that maybe you don't know yourself. Your desires, motives, tendencies, hopes, aspirations, and so on, as well as you think. I'm not gonna say that you don't know yourself. Everybody has some knowledge of self. But if someone is able to say something to you that makes you question everything, well, I would suggest that maybe digging deeper and looking harder at yourself is a solution, or one of many solutions, I'm sure. 
I want to believe I'm doing the right thing, but the consequences of my actions show me otherwise. Well, now this one is easy to answer, my friend. The outcome or consequences of your actions don't tell you anything about the morality of your actions. You can do the right thing and the consequences and results could be negative. You can't just look at the outcome and the results and say, well, the outcome was bad, therefore what I did was bad. That's not how it works. There are so many factors involved in the consequences and results and your part is just one sliver of that. What you did might have been 100% right, it might have been perfect, but because of others, because of the economy, because of whatever, the consequences of your actions don't pan out. So please don't look at the consequences and the results as the only way to gauge the quality, the morality, the value of what you're doing because that's gonna lead you astray so, so badly. And I would hate for that to happen. Well, I gotta head out now, but it was really nice chatting with you, Goodhearted, and I really love our conversations in the comment section. Please, don't hesitate, continue. I love talking about this stuff, and I will make more videos like this for you, because I care, and because you seem like a genuinely good person. I hope that you get what you're looking for, and I hope that this video was helpful to you. Until next time, live well, my friend.